We're gonna talk about hope this morning. Uh, we sprinkled it through a little bit in some conversations over the last uh, couple of months, but I wanted to do a deeper dive into this thing we call hope. And I tend to define hope as a noun, not a verb. I'm not a wisher. Anybody, any wishers in here? I wish, I wish, I wish. I, I don't think like that. Like if I want something to happen, I don't wish it to happen. I figure out, like my personality is just figure out how to make it happen. That's what, right? That's what like my kids used to say growing up, they say, oh, I wish it was Friday or I wish it was the summer or I wish we were already on vacation. And I would look at them and say, hey, don't wish your life away. There's good things to do today. Don't wish it was some other day. Live life to the fullest today. And so um, I tend to not look at hope as a verb, like I hope this happens. I tend to look at hope as a noun. I have hope. Are you following me? And we're gonna, we're gonna look into Hebrews um, and hopefully be encouraged this morning by that. But I need you to understand right up front that our hope doesn't come from anything on this earth. Now I know if you just walked into church for the first time, you're like, I was hoping for a raise. We can talk about that later. But whether you get a raise or not, you can still have hope because our hope doesn't reside in our circumstances or our, or our financial circumstances or, or, or whether taxes are gonna go up or down or whether interest rates are what they are. It just doesn't, or diesel fuel, anybody check that lately? That's not where we get our hope. We get it from somewhere else, we're gonna talk about that. Hebrews chapter 10, we're gonna start in verse 19. If you stand to your feet in honor of the word, we're gonna read through Hebrews chapter 10 and we're gonna read a little bit into that famous Hebrews chapter 11, uh, the heroes of faith. And we're gonna allow for the next, um, for the next, all the way through the sermon series to allow Hebrews chapter 11 to define what we're talking about and who we're talking about. So if you wanna be an A++ student, go home and read the rest of Hebrews chapter 11, then you'll be prepared for next week's homework. Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 19, say amen if you're ready. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which, was sanct by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you, were, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence which has a great reward for you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised for yet a little while. 
and the coming one will come without and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and, we, and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. For by, for by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. And so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. And by faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Father, we thank you this morning for your goodness to us. We thank you for your word. We pray, Lord, that we wouldn't just walk away feeling good, that we'd walk away being changed. Change us. Renew our minds this morning. And make us more like Christ. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone said, amen. You may be seated. We're going to get into this introduction to the idea of hope today. We're starting Hebrews chapter 10 and move on to chapter 11, just the beginning of it. I want to, before we do that though, let you know uh, and remind you, we are starting um, uh, what traditionally is called a capital campaign or however you want to call it. But, but if you weren't here last week, I, I told um, the congregation last week in all three campuses that Hope Community Church is in a, a very unique position. Um, this last year, we did a $400,000 uh, principal payment on the mortgage here uh, in Hedgesville. Yeah, that's a big deal. We, um, this year, we launched a church in Concord, New Hampshire in May, and then we just, a couple weeks ago, closed on the building in Berkeley Springs. And that building cost, um, cost about $400,000. We put a little bit of cash with it and, and mortgage and uh, assumed a 3.75, I think it was, 3.75. When's the last time you heard that number? 3.75% mortgage over the next three years at about $350,000 total. So as it stands, we are, we are paying cash for construction, uh, things in Berkeley Springs and here in Hedgesville. And as it stands, I believe in the next year or so that we could be totally debt-free as a church. That's a pretty crazy. Yeah. So uh, if, we, if we came together as a group, all three campuses, and, and raised 750, 800,000, 2 million, um, you just want to add that one more outlier in there, um, that we could be a debt-free church at this time next year, ready to take on the next opportunity that God has for us. Amen. So there, I just wanted to let you know, there's a card, there's a seat, a card in the seat in front of you. Uh, and there's several ways you could do this. If you prayed about it this week and you already know, uh, what God, what God would have you do. You can write that on there if you want to and say, Hey, this is a one-time gift, or I'm going to make this commitment monthly for the next year. Or you can scan that QR code and go online and do it digitally one way or the other. Um, I just, I, Beth and I are fully believers in, in the benefit of this church, not because we work here, but, but because, because it's been a part of our lives for uh, now 27 plus years. And, um, and we are committed financially to seeing this happen personally and, and the staff and the board is. And so I just wanna encourage you this morning um, uh, to just pray and find out what God would have you do. But I think as a whole church together, all three campuses that we could, we could do this uh, by the end of next year and be ready, amen? So there we go. The writer of Hebrews, we don't really know who, who he is. There's not a, some people think it might be Paul, but there's not really consensus. So that's why we say the writer of Hebrews. Uh, he, was, he was a pastor 
uh, to Jews who might have been uh, spread out during the dispersion uh, after the church started being persecuted. But either way, it's a pastoral heart talking about people in difficult times. And, and we get to chapter 10 and he starts, he starts talking about, we have this assurance, we have this confidence. And he gets into a little bit in chapter 10, a little bit of scary stuff, if we're honest. He says, it's, it's not good to be, to be in the hands of a living God in the context that he put it in. And we're going to cover that. And then he gets into this hope in the famous, in the reason for this chapter 11, this faith chapter. Now, faith is the substance of things not seen. And, and we find out in chapter 11 there, he just lists, chronicles all these heroes of the faith in the Old Testament and how they trusted God and why they trusted God. And so this is extremely important in our society today. Because if you look at the condition of the American culture, it is becoming uh, dramatically more hopeless. Think about it. Our, our trust in our governmental leaders has plummeted over the last 20 years. Our trust in institutions like, like um, did anybody remember? Now, this is before my time. I'm not acting like I was there. But anybody remember turn on the TV and like somebody like Walter Cronkite came on? He could have said, aliens have landed and they've stolen your kids. And everybody would have went, that's true. You go check on them, they might not be in the room anymore. So all, almost all these institutions, we have a lack of trust and a lack of, a lack of confidence in them. And then we, then we throw in circumstances like what we walked through in 2020, 2021. And in some areas of the United States, even into 2022, something like COVID lockdowns and we don't know who to trust and we don't know where to mask and you're wearing a mask and are you, uh, uh, and I'm not wearing a mask and, uh. and then we stop trusting each other because I can't even trust your cough anymore. I can't trust your sneeze at the table. Do you remember when it was okay to sneeze at the table? You just turned your head a little bit. Now everybody's like, whoa, whoa, you just ended dinner. We haven't even got past the appetizer. And I don't know, everybody's looking at each other like, we're going to stay here. And then we hear on the TV, like, it's coming back, it's coming. We don't know what to think. We don't know what to trust. Then you add in the drug epidemic and fentanyl. You add in the rate of suicide now. And you think, what is happening? And you combine it all together and it paints a picture of there's nothing worth it in front of me. There's nothing out there that's worth it. So why would I keep doing it? Why wouldn't I find something right now to block that pain? Why wouldn't I find something right now to take my mind off of it? Why wouldn't I consume myself with something else that I don't have to worry, I don't have to be anxious about it? Why would, because there's nothing out there I see. It's like America's walked into a long tunnel that has no light at the end of it. Our association with church and, and God is dropping at a rate never seen before. And organizations and denominations that, that we used to look at, the, the largest ones in America, are their attendance is plummeting. And so we paint the whole picture and we go, man, it's kind of bleak out there and inflation and all these things. And you feel the psyche of America kind of tighten up and go, I don't see any, I don't see anything on the horizon. And, um, and just a little personal commentary here for a second, by the way, our political seasons are so short it is, um, it is not helpful to put our hope in politicians. Unless you want your hope to be in four-year cycles. And I think that's a little depressing. So the writer of Hebrews comes along and he says, first of all, 
I need to remind you that we can have this confidence now. Now, now you say, well, why is that so important? We talk about having confidence uh, to go before God all the time. You have to remember he was writing to Jewish people who had been taught their whole lives uh, that, that there was only certain people that could go into the presence of God. The high priest, there, there, was, there was only certain times and there was only certain circumstances and that normal people didn't just confidently go before God. It wasn't, there, there wasn't a pathway into the temple to be able to do that. And so the writer of Hebrews is reminding them that, listen, since Jesus has died and resurrected, some of you may remember at the crucifixion when Jesus said, it is finished, there is a veil in the temple that separated the, uh, this place they called the Holy of Holies that you couldn't go into. And when Jesus died, that veil split open, symbolically representing that now we have access to God. Could you imagine having access, all of a sudden access to something that you, it's like, it's better than winning the Powerball. What is it, almost a billion dollars again or something like that? I don't know, you wanna pull it together and see if we can get it, church paid off? Um, that was a joke. Everybody's like, hey, that sounds like a plan. Um, no, but imagine that. Imagine this is better than that. Imagine having money struggles and then having access to unlimited resources. So the writer of Hebrews is saying, remember, remember we have this confidence that we can approach God. Remember when you lived without that confidence. Now you have this confidence to be able to approach God. That's a big deal. So he's explaining to them, he's reminding them of their position. They're confident. They're clean. Not like, not like they washed with dove soap. But their sins have been removed and they have been assured of their future. So he's painting this in, ver in chapter 10. Hey, listen, you can be confident. You can approach God in this confident manner. Not 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 arrogant, but confident. You know there's two different things. You don't go to God and say, hey, you're gonna do this for me. No, you go to God confidently, Lord, you are capable, willing, able, and I'm your child, and I'm coming to you with confidence that you're for me and that you have my best, you have my best for me. That's confidence. I can boldly approach his throne. So this is a new position he's teaching. Here's what they grew up with. Exodus chapter 19, verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses, you thought they were going for a camping trip. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire and the smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain trembled greatly and as, as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. Now this is a scene that would make all of us scared to death. Like this is happening in front of the Israelites and they were warned, do not come up on this mountain or you will die. God is here. And so now the writer of Hebrews is saying, that's not our relationship to God anymore. Jesus died and resurrected and gave us access. Guess what you can do now? You can walk to the top of the mountain confidently. You can walk up there and be with God. You can be, you can, you can be in your house and confidently be in the presence of God. Not because you're great, but because Jesus. But because of Jesus. So he's saying we have this, we have this confidence now. So he opened the door for us. He opened the way for us through a sacrifice to be confident. Now, I need to warn you, Jesus died on the cross because God never lowered his standards. So, are you, are you hearing me? God never lowered his standards, so Jesus has to die on the cross to meet the standards to make us, us righteous. So, guess what? We live in an era of grace, right? You can, go to, you can sin, go to, go, to, 
God for forgiveness. He will forgive you. If you are faithful to confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. The, cross, the sacrifice of Jesus cleans us and makes us righteous. Amen. But the requirements are still the same. It's, we didn't get into sin light era. God is not going, wow, oh, isn't that bad? Forget about it. No, it's still sin. The sin that was sin in the Old Testament is still sin today in the New Testament. Amen? The benefit we have is that we can come to, come to God because we've been forgiven of that sin. Not because, not because he's changed his mind about it. Okay. And for that reason, I need you to understand, this has to be taken seriously. The problem with the modern day church is we don't take it serious. And we're like, oh man, it's fine. Jesus loves you. He does. But he doesn't want you to be dumb. Amen? Jesus loves you. This I know because the Bible tells me so. And there should be another line in there. Don't be dumb. And here's why the writer of Hebrews says this. For if we go on sinning, can you put that verse up? Chapter 10, verse 26. For if we go on sinning, there's a word in there. Okay, I need to explain something to you. This is not a character flaw. He's not talking about you have an addiction issue. He's not, he's not talking about that. He, he, he's, he's not talking about like, like I'm dealing with sin in my life, trying to figure out how to eradicate it. The writer of Hebrews actually right now is talking about people who knew the grace of God and are rejecting it. I don't need him anymore. If we go on deliberately sinning after I've received the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. What he's essentially saying here is this. He's saying, okay, if you reject the grace of God, there is only judgment left. So what the church has to understand, what we have to understand is that, is that we have assurance to go before God because of Jesus. We have been made clean through the blood of Jesus. We have been forgiven. But if we push that off in our life, we say, I don't need it anymore. I don't need this thing. He's, the writer of Hebrews is giving them a warning. Don't play with this. Don't play with this because there's not option A, B, and C. There's not, he's forgiven me and there's grace or there's no grace or there's a little bit of me in the middle. There is option A or B. And if I reject the grace of God, there is only judgment left. There is no middle ground. Are you following me? So he's saying, you can't play with this thing. You can't play with this. You can't act like you can just go off and do whatever you want and reject the grace of God and reject what he's done for you and act like you're still part of the family. So that's a tough portion of scripture. Amen. Then he gets into what, the basis of what we're going to talk about. He tells them we can come confidently before God. It's not something we can play with. But then all down through this portion of scripture, you hear, you hear a unifying message. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who has promised is faithful. Why are we holding fast? Because our hope is out there. Are you following me? And the one who promised us what would happen is faithful. So what he's saying is it will happen. So what is yet to come will come. And we can count on that because the one who promised it, that it would come is faithful. So our hope is out there. Hebrews 10, 34. For you had compassion on those in prison. You joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. You, they were able to give up what they had on, on, in this life because they knew they had a better one to come. Do you see the theme? Hebrews chapter 10, 36. For you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is Promised out in the future. 
Hebrews 11, 6, and without faith is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek him. When you get rewarded, the, 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 the theme that ties us together, he's telling, he's telling these believers, hey, listen, listen, you're in a new position through Christ. You have confident access to God. Don't play with that. But in your circumstance right now, now, can we just be totally transparent? Because if I don't, my good friend, Nat Sagenario, who reviews all my sermons will say, Chris, why didn't you bring that up? So Nat, I'm bringing it up. <laughs> he does that to me every week. And I'm gonna give him credit for this. He always tells me, Chris, these, these saints in Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, were suffering physically for the gospel. Did you just read it? It said they plundered your houses. Now, can we be honest? Somebody criticizing you on Facebook because you put a praying emoji up, it's not the same. It's not the same. It's not even close. Because you could turn Facebook off. And then you won't suffer persecution anymore. Wow, it's that easy. Hey, I'm getting persecuted online. Whoa, it's hard. Do you know what happens? When they plunder your house, you can't turn that off. So I always try to contextualize with you that what we read in scripture is this extreme and we are flipping out because of this extreme. So it would be, it would be disingenuous to compare our sufferings to the ones he writes about. And so whenever I read these things, I go, Lord, if my suffering is a fraction or not even to be equated with what they suffered in the first century church, in, 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 the, in the Jews who were scattered outside of Jerusalem, if my suffering is not even to be, to be compared in the same sentence, why don't I embrace this hope more? He's saying, listen, he's promised you, he's promised you, he's promised you, he's promised you, he's promised you. You can do it. You can have hope. You can have hope. Now, there, there's this issue with hope by itself can get, there's got to be a thing attached to hope to make it work out. So this is what he tells him. He's actually quoting in Hebrews chapter 10, 37. He's actually quoting from the minor prophet Habakkuk. He says, for yet a little while and the coming one will come and without delay. He reminds him, he's coming back. So I need, to, I need to draw everybody in real quick. Okay, ready? The writer of Hebrews was not promising them wealth. He was not promising them prosperity. He was not promising them health. He was not promising them any, any of those things. He was saying, you can go confidently before God. God will supply all your needs according to riches. Like, this is all that teaching. God is for you. He's with you. He's there to give you peace. He's there to do all those things. What the writer of Hebrews is promising them is that Jesus is coming back. Now, <laughs> I can tell you I was expecting that response. Yeah. Because it's been a long time. We talked about this last week. It's been a long time. And everybody's like in the room going, yeah. You know they just did a government investigation into aliens too, Chris. The church has been doing this Jesus coming back thing for a long time. Mm -hmm. We have. And they did as well. And just because it takes a while doesn't mean it's not true. And my fear is when a church loses its hope in the return of Christ, we lose hope.
And if we're going to hope in an idea of floating around in heaven as cherubims playing harps and just existing in this weird other universe, it won't work. The writer of Hebrews was talking to a group of people who had suffered and said, he was telling them, your savior is coming. You can count on it. And your existence on this earth for a tiny little bit will be worth enduring through and worth serving him and worth acting out in faith because when he returns, what he brings with him will be beyond any expectation you could ever imagine in your mind. There's not been a human being alive on this planet who has ever been able to conceive what God has went and prepared for us. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, listen, it's worth it. And the problem with the modern church is all we can conceptualize is what he can do for us tomorrow. We never think past, what if tomorrow doesn't work out? Is it still worth it? What if in six months it doesn't work out? Is it still worth it? And he's telling, the pastor is telling the church, I'm telling you it's worth it. He is coming back. And when the church operates, I know that, I know you're like, man, this is old school preacher, Chris. I don't know if people in this century are gonna take it. The Bible also says that will happen. And that we, as the church, if you just showed up here, you're not a part of the church yet, hurry up and get on board. We, as part of the church, have to look past the current circumstance, have to look past our current bodies, our current, our current stages, and go, he promised. And what he promised me is past this. What he promised me is past this. What he promised me is past any pain I'm experiencing. What he promised me is past any difficulties I'm in. What he's promised me is past any persecution I could suffer. What he's promised me is true and it's worth me hanging on. Amen? So let's talk about faith. The band's gonna come up. We'll end with this. Faith is the hope we have in the promise of Christ compelling us to do things. Did you hear that? Faith is the evidence, the assurance, the substance of things that we have not seen yet. That we have not seen yet. So faith is me acting out on what he promised me. Are you hearing me? So when the writer of Hebrews in chapter 10 says some, he says five things that we should be doing. Watch this. They are all rooted in the hope we have in eternity. And you have to have faith to do them. Watch this, draw near to God. He then, he then says later on in chapter 11, well, you can't even come to God without faith. You have to believe he exists. And so he says in chapter 10, draw near to God. With faith, I'm drawing near to God. Okay, then he says, hold fast to the confession without wavering. What's that mean? Remember he said, don't you, don't you accept the grace of God and then reject it? Hold fast to that confession. What is your confession? That he is real and that he's forgiven me of my sins. Amen? And that he's the Lord of my life. Draw near to God, hold fast to the confession. The third thing, stir up one another to love and good works. You know how much faith it takes to stir somebody else up? Don't look at your neighbor. You probably live with them. You've been praying for a long time. Lord, give me enough faith because they need a lot of stirring. No, he's saying as a community, we should have faith for each other. Are you hearing that? As a community, we should be stirring one another up to love and good works. We should continue to meet together. Do you know what the biggest hurdle for us is now? The church, he's been gone 2,000 years, not coming back. Why would we meet together? takes faith to get together on Sunday morning and say, I do believe he's coming. And it's worth me being a community of believers to be ready when he comes. Amen. And then the last one, encourage one another. Our actions prove out what our hope is placed in. These ability, the ability to do these five things, no matter what the circumstance shows, 
that our hope is in the one who is faithful beyond our ability, that we can endure because he has promised. Now I'm gonna leave you with this last thing, stand up. Endurance, endurance. This word endurance he uses, I wanna paint you a picture of it at the end here, endurance. When you think about somebody doing an endurance race, it's like you've gotta have endurance for the race, right? Like, I'm gonna do a triathlon, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, my triathlons are like walk, paddle, and get somebody to drive a car for me. Um, <laughs> I was reading this week a, a, a better definition of endurance that the writer of Hebrews is using. And it means stay past, stay past the thing. Stay past the thing. So, so I'm, I'm changing my philosophy a little bit. Like we think about endurance to be able to hold up in the middle of it. Do you ever think about that? Like, oh, they've got endurance. Why? Because they're in the middle of it. They're holding up well in the middle of it. Like, oh, they've worked out. They've, they can stand up in the middle of those things. We think about endurance. Endurance is really the evidence that you made it past what is happening to you. And so what our culture needs now is a church who sees past what is happening and then has been empowered to act in faith in the middle of what's happening to last past what's happening. Are you following that? So here we are. I need your eyes to look past what your current circumstance is right now. I don't care what it is. I don't care what it is, how I'm not being flippant. I'm not, I'm not disregarding your circumstance, but trust me when I tell you this, if you put your head down and you just think about what's happening, it might not be worth it. I'll just be honest with you. That's why the Bible doesn't tell us to think about our circumstances. Fix your mind on things above. That's what it tells us. Having the same mind as Christ for the joy set before him endured the cross. The reason he was able to stay past it is because he believed in something past it. So I need everybody right now to think about where you are, but then think God has something for me past this. There is a past, look at your neighbor and say, there's a past this. Tell him, don't look, if you're having marriage trouble, don't say that. Don't say it that way. <laughs> That wasn't helpful. But say together, there's a past this. Amen? If you're having trouble with your kids, look at your, look at your spouse and say, there's a past this. If you're, having, if you're having health problems this morning, look at your neighbor and say, hey, there's a past this. If you're in financial trouble, look at your neighbor and say, there's a past this. If you're having trouble at work, say, there's a past this. Because he's promised us a hope that we can be confident in him. The one who has promised is faithfully said. And what does he do? Through that hope, then we act out in faith and we say, I can do this. Not because of my own strength, but because he who promised is faithful. And I am going to endure, not just in the middle of it, but I'm going all the way past it. I'm going past it. If we could have churches all across America, with a, a stay past it mentality, it would change our culture. It would change our culture. Can I pray that over you this morning? Our hope is not where you are, it's past where you are. And he's faithful to get you past there. And he is coming back. Father, we thank you for this. Lord, I'm asking you right now, the enemy seems to have a lock on our minds sometimes. And he pulls us down into the current ditch we are in. And we struggle to lift our heads up. But I'm asking you today that we would lift our heads to where our help comes from. We would fix our eyes on the author and finisher of our faith. We would we would see past our current circumstance and Lord, it would cause us to act out in faith today. It would cause us to respond in faith. It would cause us, Lord, to do things that show the evidence of what has not happened yet. 
Lord, I pray that as a church, we could act out as if it was already done because your promise is true. Lord, infuse us with that faith, faith this morning as we look past to your promise. Infuse us with that faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Church, could you thank him this morning? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hey, listen, consider that pledge this morning. We'll be back here next week talking about hope again. Act out on it this week. We'll see you then.